Okay. Um, when we left off, this is a lecture for my uh, second hour class on the 30th of uh, March. When we left off yesterday, we were in the middle of the second day of the uh, Battle of Gettysburg. Is that true? Mm -hmm. Got a little round top. I have a. Uh, you can move that globe off your desk if you'd like. I have the Confederates attack sickles. Okay. All right. Very good. Very good. That tells me exactly where I need to be. Um, well, on the second day of the battle, let me just refresh our memories as to the <clears throat> first day. <clears throat> on the first day of the Battle of Gettysburg, <clears throat> Lee had three corps heading north out west of town. The closest one to the town well, he actually had one that had passed through the day before, and it was up here north. And the closest corps to the town was commanded by a man named A.P. Hill. And uh, Hill was uh, camped out west of the town. Nobody intended to fight on July the 1st. Nobody intended to fight at Gettysburg. In fact, Lee had given pretty explicit, explicit orders not to engage the enemy until they all, all three corps reached Harrisburg, and then they would come together and crush the Union Army. But, uh, of course, some people say this is a myth, but uh, Hill, uh, he had a captain, I almost said his name, or, or a major, anyway, I almost said his name, but he wanted to sweep through the town looking for shoes. At least that's the way the legend goes. <coughs> you, you often hear Gettysburg referred to as the battle that was fought over shoes or started over shoes. Well, uh, that may or may not be true. But anyway, we do know the Confederates uh, pulled off what is called in the military a reconnaissance in force. You don't just send three guys out to scout. Five or 600 men went marching down that road with the intention of just sweeping through the town and then rejoining Hill's division as they continued to march north. But they ran into John Buford and about 3,000 American U.S. cavalrymen out here, and a battle started. And Hill fed more and more men in. Lee's off here. By the time Lee arrives on the battlefield, the Union forces are being pushed back through Gettysburg, uh, back toward this ridge. There are two ridges south of town. They're roughly a mile apart. Uh, and here they are. They're shaped like fish hooks. This is Cemetery Ridge. That's where the Union Army fought the battle from. And of course, by the time Lee arrives, and probably the smart thing for Lee to do would have been to rein up, to pull up, and continue to march on toward Harrisburg before he could, uh, until he could bring his army together. But Lee, uh, you know, of course, was racing against the clock. His time in the North was limited. He had to win quickly or none at all. He said, "We've we've engaged the enemy," and so the entire Confederate army began to swing toward Gettysburg. Uh, and the entire Union Army is coming. It's interesting that at this battle, the, the Southern forces initially came from the North and the Northern forces came up from the South. Uh, but the Northern forces, 90,000 of them will eventually filter in here, 70 or 75,000 Confederates over here. The Union fights the battle from Cemetery Ridge. The Confederates fight the battle from Seminary Ridge, okay? So, uh, and on the first day, that's essentially what happened. The Confederates captured the town. They'll hold it for the next two days. Uh, they failed to take Culp's Hill, which is very, very important. Uh, they, we'll talk about that later, but they failed to take Culp's Hill, and the Union forces were dug in on this ground. And, of course, the Confederates are going to have to do the attacking. Again, uh, they can't stay here forever. So they're going to have to destroy the Union Army, and that means they're going to have to come across this valley, and they're going to have to go up, and they're going to have to hit entrenched troops on high ground. Some historians have said, I'm not a historian, I'm a history teacher, but some historians have said, and I believe this, uh, that the battle was won and lost on the first day. When the North took the high ground, it was over. Uh, and the next two days fighting, this is for some, the next two days fighting didn't make a bit of it didn't make any difference. It's one theory, it's one theory. But anyway, on the second day, a Confederate officer rode over here. There are two hills. This is a few miles from Gettysburg. You can almost stand up here and see Gettysburg almost. <clears throat> uh, they rode over to, uh, you know, really this whole battle is fought from about, uh, you know, Texana Road up there down to, uh, 
you know, two miles or a mile south of Eufaula. It's in a confined area just about this big. And there are 165,000 men fighting, okay, in that area. But the next day, a Confederate officer rode over to the uh, Union lines, just sort of scouting, and he rode up on top of a little round top, two big hills. There's a big, big round top and there's a little round top. He rode up on a little round top, and he could see the entire Union line exposed. The Union flank was just hanging in the air here. They didn't have any troops down here to defend these two hills. And, of course, he said, if we can get artillery up here, we won't have to run across that valley and attack ent entrenched troops. We can simply blast the Union line apart. And he rode back, and he told his commanding officer, went up the chain of command to Lee. Lee said, uh, you know, he, he said to his second in command, James Longstreet, we're going to strike them there. You know, and this is at about 9 o'clock in the morning. Lee and Longstreet are having this conversation. But one of the things you always have to factor in when you look, say, why did Gettysburg turn out, turn out the way it did is a divided command. Lee was for the attack, as always. He's an offensive general. Uh, offense, offense, offense. Uh, and Longstreet was uh, leery about this. Longstreet, he had this plan. We ought to march the Confederate Army. We ought to abandon Gettysburg. And we ought to march the Confederate Army around and place our army here. Dig in south of Gettysburg and make between Gettysburg, between the Union Army and Washington, D.C., and make the Confederate, uh, the Union Army attack us. Instead of us attacking entrenched troops, we will, will uh, force them to attack us. And we, what we will do is essentially pull off another Fredericksburg. Okay. <laughs> and uh, Lee orders Longstreet to attack. Uh, the flank here to take Little Round Top. Uh, Lee was, uh, excuse me, uh, Longstreet was absolutely against that. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, it takes these Confederates, they get the order at about 10 o'clock in the morning, and if they'd have just made a swift run over there, um, they would have um, they would have probably taken Little Round Top, and then we we'll, would see. They would have turned the Union flank. Uh, we will see what that would have done or we would have seen what that would have done. Maybe the Confederates would have won the battle, but it takes these troops all day to line up. And I'm not being overly critical of Longstreet. Look, if you've ever been at band practice, for any of you in the band, you've ever been at band practice on the first day of band, you've got 75 or 80 people. And are you in band? On the first day when they blow the whistle, do you all just come to attention? Everybody's in play. No, does it take a little while to sort that out? Yeah, well, imagine if there were 20,000 of you out there. So, uh, but anyway, uh, and the, uh, you know, Confederates are, you know, getting in line here. They're raising a lot of dust. And at that time, a, a Union officer rides up here. Uh, what was his name? Is it, that's not Schofield. It was Warren, General Warren, right? So did, I, did I tell you his name yesterday, General Warren? Governor Warren. Yeah, did I show you him? His statue, did I show you a statue up there? Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, he rides up, and there's nobody there. I mean, there's just nobody here, and this is the left This is the left flank of the Union Army, and he sees what is about to happen. So he starts scurrying the area here, looking for troops, any troops, to just throw up there on little round top and, and a little round top and try and hold it. Uh, so while he's – and he finds the 20th Maine. Did we get the 20th Maine down in Joshua Chamberlain? Okay, a college professor, you know, did no military experience, but he does pretty darn good. And those, uh, the 20th Maine. And, and so they, but, but again, you know, when I say that, you know, students often think, you know, well, they just magically appear. No, it's going to take them a while to get up there. They've got up there a few miles away. They've got to march up there. They've got to get ready for this attack. So, Anyway, while all this activity is going on on Little Round Top, there was a, a Union general right here. Did we do Daniel Sickles? Yeah. Dan Sickles. Uh, well, uh, there's Warren looking across. That's what he would have been. You see how close all this is. You know, on the tour, we walk from there up to Little Round Top. There is Little Round Top. There's the road we walk. Uh, wasn't there the day of the battle, believe it or not. But anyway, there it is. <laughs> and uh, there's another shot of it. Uh, there's Joshua. And there's Dan Sickles, quite an interesting character. Dan Sickles uh, was a career Army officer. Uh, he was married, but he was a notorious philanderer. He cheated on his wife, okay? If it would stand still, he would cheat on his wife with it, okay? And he, that was just known 
throughout Washington, D.C. And uh, eventually his wife came to the conclusion, well, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. So she took a, lo a lover. In fact, the lover she took was Philip Key. He was, uh, Philip Key was the uh, son of Francis Scott Key, who wrote the national anthem, right? Remember that? Well, and he was 41 years old and he was considered to be the most handsome man in Washington. So while Daniel Sickles is out cavorting around the town, well, his wife is cavort cavorting around the town with Philip Barton Key. And uh, finally, his wife, uh, I guess she got a guilty conscience and she confessed to, to Daniel Sickles that she was cheating on him. Daniel Sickles was determined to get even. And so one morning he left home and they lived right across the street from the White House. Okay. There are a series of townhouses still there. Blair House was one, for example. And they lived right across the street. And right out in front of the White House is Lafayette Park. I think it's Lafayette Park. Yeah. There's a park and there's a statue of Andrew Jackson there. And so... <clears throat> This guy is determined to catch the, you know, he's, gonna, he's very angry and he's determined to catch the guy who's uh, uh, committing adultery with his wife. And so he sort of left early that morning, pecked her on the cheek. I'll see you later today, dear. All is forgiven. Don't worry. And he just sort of went out and lost himself in the crowd out there on Pennsylvania Avenue. And eventually he sees Philip Barton Key come along and he sits on a bench and he starts making signals toward his house. You know, he's trying to signal to uh, uh, Sickles' wife, is he gone yet? And Sickles observes this, and he walks over. Uh, Key is sitting on a bench right across the street from the White House. He walks over, pulls a pistol out, and he shot and killed Philip Key, shot him five times, okay? And there were all these witnesses. So, of course, he's arrested, and he goes to jail, and his lawyer, his lawyer entered the first, for the first in, in American history, his lawyer entered the first temporary insanity plea in the history of U.S. jurisprudence. And he got off, okay, and he goes back to the Army. But to what he said was he was so angry that he temporarily lost his mind and he killed, he shot poor Philip Key, Philip Barton Key, five times, and then he looked at the bloody body. His wits came back to him and he said, did I do that? Uh, and he got off. Okay. Temporary. Insane. So he's down there. Okay. There's been a lot of interesting people down there. Uh, he's down there uh, right here. And as uh, you pointed out, his men were down in a, we would call it almost a gully in Oklahoma, but a depression like this. Uh, and in, up north in Gettysburg, they call that a swale. And his fear was this, you know, they can see those Confederates over there getting ready. His fear that when the Confederates attack, they'll just come up and shoot us like fish in a barrel. So what he did is that he moved his regiment. Look at this. He moved his regiment up to the peach orchard. Okay. And as I said yesterday, I think the peach orchard is still there. It's a peach orchard. In fact, I give lectures in the peach orchard when we go up there. But look, it just created a hole. And these Confederates see that, and it's just like waving a red flag in the face of a bull. And got this down at about 4 o'clock on July 2nd. That's, it's, it's, a, it's a late day battle. At about 4 o'clock, <clears throat> Longstreet struck uh, with William Oates commanding the 15th Alabama. William Barksdale, you don't have to write all these guys down, but William, William Barksdale uh, commanding a, a regiment of Mississippians. And perhaps besides Longstreet, the most famous man there was from Texas, John Bell Hood. He was called the Lion of the South. Uh, his reputation was if you wanted a position taken, send him. They can't stop him. John Bell Hood attacked with a regiment of Texans. And they hit Sickles. I mean, he's just out here by himself. They hit him and knocked his regiment back. Uh, he, he was on his horse trying to rally his regiment. I'll put his picture back up here. He was trying to, they were running for dear life, and that hole is just getting bigger and bigger, and the Confederates are heading on toward the round tops. It looks like a battle won here. Uh, out there in that uh, swale, uh, Sickles is trying to rally his troops and a cannonball hit him in the leg. 
and it just it didn't completely shoot it off, but it was just dangling there, and he fell off of his horse. Well, these troops are already demoralized, and word went out to, among the regiment that's running, General Sickles is dead. We've lost our commanding officer. And of course, Sickles wanted to try and stop the pandemonium, so uh, he told them, he said, uh, put me on a cot, uh, and they put him on a cot, and he had them put a fresh cigar in his mouth, and they lit it, and he goes, uh, they carry him off the field and he's going through those troops uh, saying, stop and fight men, but he's got a big smile on his face. Like, this is nothing. This is just a flesh wound. And they take him over and saw his leg off. Uh, and uh, they put his leg, uh, the, the bone from it, uh, they preserved that. It's in the, it's in a, a, a medical museum in Washington, D.C. today. You can go and see it. In fact, he lives, I think, until 1902. He lives a long time. Uh, but he would go up there. It's in the uh, Museum of Health and Medicine in Washington, D.C., if you want to go see his leg. <coughs> but he would go up there every July the 2nd and visit it because that was the day he lost his leg back in Gettysburg. But all that aside, you know, so his uh, regiment is in full retreat. Uh, Barksdale's Mississippians were streaming through. And by the way, they're going to go right past, Barksdale's Mississippians are going to go right past a uh, little round top, just sort of angling up, or excuse me, big round top. They're going to go right past big round top, sort of angling up like this. Uh, and Oates's Alabamians are coming in, and Hood's people are there. It looks like they're going to turn the Union flank. And if this had happened, the plan was just to roll this up. And if they, if the Union forces hadn't held it a little round top, not much fighting goes on a big round top. But if they hadn't held that little round top, that's probably what would have happened, and Lee would have finally won the battle. Barksdale's Mississippians are, are between, they're going between Little Round Top. They're trying to get around here and turn the Union flank. And Barksdale gets shot right here. I think he got shot with grape shot and he falls off. Here he is. He just really, there he is. There's William Barksdale before the war uh, from Mississippi. And he falls off of his horse and the, his aides run to him and they try and give him water. And every time he would breathe, water would come out of his chest. And his last words were, tell my wife and my children that I died with my face toward the enemy. Well, as I say, it looked like an end run. The only thing at this point between the Union, uh, the Confederate Army and Little Round Top, get this down, was a Minnesota, uh, a Minnesota, not, a, not even a regiment, a group of Minnesotans, 262 of them, 262 of them. And they could see those 20,000 Confederates coming, 262 against 20,000 Confederates. And at that point, at that point, these Alabamians are bearing down on them. 262 men of the first, first Minnesota, okay, and there they are standing there watching this tidal wave of Confederates come at them. Their general, a general rides up named Winfield Scott Hancock. And he turned to the commander of those 200. That's the only guys there, 262 people. That's not, there are more people in high, here in school this morning than there were there. And he turned to the commander of those troops. And, you know, here come the Confederates with their flag in front of them. And he said to him, he said, seize those colors. In other words, attack. And the 262 Minnesotans went forward. It was a suicide charge. 145 of them were killed and wounded, but they stopped temporarily. They stopped the Confederates in their tracks. They hit those Alabamians and stopped them. Meanwhile, on the other side of Little Round Top, so this is all going on sort of here. Meanwhile, on the other side, in the front of Little Round Top, uh, some Alabamians and Texans, uh, particularly Texans, entered into uh, a little valley right here. Write this down, called the Devil's Den, okay? And they're heading directly toward Little Round Top. They're heading directly toward it. Uh, you know, the Confederates are ma mounting a major assault, just like this, and a group of Texans are coming through Devil's Den. And here is, well, I had it. I don't know where I did with it. Here is... That's not it. Well, anyway, there's a little round top. This road leads right to the Devil's Den. And they're trying to get around little round top and flank them, okay? 
Uh, well, out in Devil's Den, I don't know why I don't have a picture of that. Devil's Den, get this down, it became known as the Valley of Death, okay, the Valley of Death. Because here go these Texans and Alabama, Alabamians charging through there. There's a little stream that runs through there, but there are these big gigantic boulders. Perfect, perfect sniper's nest. And there, get this down, there in those granite rocks, uh, were a group of New Hampshire uh, sharpshooters, okay? New Hampshire sharpshooters. There weren't very many of them. They're the second, especially they've got rifles with scopes on them. They're the second U.S. snipers. They were outnumbered 10 to 1. And by the way, these guys wear green uniforms with green buttons because they don't, when you're a sniper, you don't want anything that can... Uh, deflect the sun, cause a little flash there. The enemy can see it and kill you. There aren't very many of them. And they've taken up position across this valley behind those boulders. And in come, uh, in come the 15th Alabama and uh, Hood's Texas. And it was a very, very bloody advance. You know, what they would do is they would hold the position till the last minute. And then when the Confederates were about to overrun them, they would fall back uh, and hold that position and then fall back before it's all over. They had killed and wounded. These this small band of snipers had, had killed and wounded 40%, 40% of the 15th Alabama, the 15th Alabama, killed or wounded. And they had slowed the Confederate advance. Eventually, they will be driven back. Eventually, they will be driven back. It's, it's sort of, it's just, it's, that's a little, it's right over here. You see, they're trying to get around, but it's right, there it is. You can see some of the boulders. And that's where the Texans and the Alabamians came through trying to get around this, okay? I don't know why I don't have a picture of that. But anyway, whoops, there we go. Eventually, the New Hampshire men are driven back on Little Round Top. By that time, get this down, the 20th Maine had gotten up to Little Round Top. The 20th Maine had finally arrived there. And they started digging in, started digging in. Uh, and by digging in, I mean they stacked up rocks, I'll try. I'm going to get some pictures of this tomorrow. I just I should have done it today. But when you when we go to Gettysburg, you know what, what most people do is they just tramp right up on top of a little round top and take pictures. On, when you go around little round top, which is what the Confederates were trying to do and never made it. When you're walking up there, there's just a little trail. It's sort of shrouded with brush. Go on that because that's where the actual fighting on little round top took place. It didn't take place. It didn't take place. Uh, well, drat. It didn't take place there all the way around. And then there's a little trail that just sort of slopes off to the side. That's where the where where, where Joshua a lot of people think Joshua Chamberlain and all these there. No, they weren't. They were all south and east of Little Round Top. It's a part of Little Round Top, but south and east of Little Round Top. And you can still see the rock wall that Chamberlain, it's still there, not a replica. You can still see the rock wall that Chamberlain and his men put up, you know, hurriedly, about that tall, okay? Uh, and so uh, Chamberlain and his men are there when the Alabamians and Texans arrive, and the Confederates, I'll just say this, get this down, they launched five bloody attacks. Five times they came up. The backside, I'll just put it that way, the backside of Little Round Top, and five times they were driven back down. After the fourth attack, you think about these 1,200 men up there trying to hold against thousands of Confederates. After the fourth attack, they were out of ammunition. You know, Joshua Chamberlain's men didn't have any more ammunition. And they had, of course, there weren't 1,200 of them left anymore. They were at a wall like this. And the Confederates were attacking here. And they had come up four times and been driven back down four times. And, uh, you know, Ch uh, the Chamberlain's officers report the men don't have any more ammunition. Well, there's no more ammunition to get. I mean, in the movies, it would fall out the sky and everybody would be happy. But Chamberlain said this. He said, then fix bayonets. He said, the next time we come up, we're going to charge them. And, of course, that, the Confederates, that's the last thing they expected. And by the way, it's hot. It's July. These men are in wool, wool uniforms. They've been marching and fighting all day. I, th I think, the, the, except what they had in their canteens, and that was long gone, the Confederates hadn't had any water for six hours. You go out here and run around the parking lot for six hours next July the 2nd. 
uh, and don't drink water for six hours and see how you feel. So the site I were dehydrated, uh, you know, we, we can't even have a 40 minute class and people are consuming gallons of water in here. Oh my God, I'm dying of thirst. Well, just imagine these guys. Chamberlain took some of his men. He left the line there, but he took some of his men and he put them like this, okay? And his plan was this. He said, when the Confederates come, and he could see the Confederates forming down the hill, when the Confederates come, I'm going to, we're going to charge. We're going to catch them by surprise. We're coming over this wall. And these men, I just want you to swing around and hit them in the flank. Uh, and when the Confederates come charging up for the fifth time, that is exactly what happened. And it completely caught the Confederates uh, by surprise. Not only are they attacked from the front, and the Confederates, a lot of the Confederates simply, they were so shocked by that, they threw down their guns in front of the wall and stuck their hands up. And then, of course, these guys come and hit them on the flank. And these, uh, the, the survivors of the 20th Massachusetts drive them down uh, back into the valley there, and uh, they saved the left flank. The Confederates were not able to take Little Round Top, and they probably saved the country. I mean, You've got the 1,200 men, and of course they're hurrying reinforcements there as quickly as they can, but to move troops might take a half a day. Uh, but uh, essentially this country came down to 1,200 men and a group of uh, sharpshooters from New Hampshire, okay, that held back the Confederate tidal wave. Well, darkness fell. The fighting stopped because it got dark. There were dead Confederates and wounded Confederates and Union troops all over this field here. If you ever go to Gettysburg, uh, you'll see people acting like straight running idiots. I expect someday to walk by that tree and there'll be, you know, I don't know, six middle school students hanging from the limbs with their teacher grinning like a ninny at the bottom taking pictures. But you just remember, brave men died all over this place. When you go on a battlefield, you're not going to a picnic at Posey Park. You're on sacred ground and you ought to act that way. And I don't care <clears throat> if you're the only one that acts that way. You ought to act that way. You shouldn't act like a nut. And you see, sadly, not many, but sadly, you see people You see people doing that. But if you're ever on sacred ground, when you're right here, you'll be on sacred, you'll be on sacred ground. Well, Chamberlain and his men were fought out. Lee almost won on the second day. He almost turned the Union flank, almost. If they say close, but no cigar. That night, the 20th Maine, literally laying down in these rocks, exhausted. They told them, let me go back to a map of Gettysburg. The 20th Maine literally fought out here. They said, look, guys, we're going to move you to a place along the line where you can get some rest, where it's safer. And they moved them to the center of the Union lines. As they, as they are moving the 20th Maine, fought to a frazzle, scarred for life, the things those boys saw that day. As they moved them to the middle of the line, Lee was over here planning his next day's battle, which would involve a 15,000-man assault right through the center of the line. So the poor 20th Maine, they jump out of the frying pan into the fire, as the old saying used to go. So that will take us to day three. Get this down. That will take us to day three. The third day of the battle. And of course, Lee, still confident. And he has even more reason to be confident because, because uh, Jeb Stewart had finally showed up with 10,000 cavalrymen while the little round top was going on. Jeb Stewart comes in. So, and plus, get this down a Virginia general had showed up with 15,000 fresh troops. That, had, that had, had not fought one minute in this battle. And his name was George Pickett, okay? George Pickett. Now, of course, they always talk about Pickett's Virginia Division. And a, and a lot of them were, a lot of those 15,000 men were um, Virginians, but there were Georgians there. There were North Carolinians there. I think there were some people from Louisiana there. And, all of these people in these various state historical societies, when you talk about Pickett's Virginians, they get offended and say, hey, we were there too. So it's not just Virginians, but anyway, 15,000, 15,000 fresh troops. 
And um, Lee thought like this. He said, we have fought on the right flank and the left flank on the first two days. And he suspected that Meade had taken men out of the center of his line to reinforce his flanks. And Lee said, the weak spot will be the center of the Union line. So with these 15,000 fresh troops, I am going to send those troops tomorrow, Sunday, July the 3rd, 1863. I'm going to send those troops right through the center of the Union line. Meanwhile, look at this. Jeb Stewart will be up here. When the battle starts, Jeb Stewart with 10,000 cavalrymen will be up here, and he will come down and place himself right here, just waiting. And when the Union line breaks, uh, he will uh, kill any surviving Union troops that are fleeing. He will attack. These two forces will link up. The Union army will be split. It will be destroyed. We will march rapidly to Washington, hand Lincoln the surrender terms in the White House, and the war will be over. That's the third, the third day plan. That's the third day plan. Of course, a uh, couple of problems. Let's see here. There's the field. That's Cemetery Ridge right there. Wait a minute, excuse me. That's Seminary Ridge. Sorry. That's the Lee statue right there. That's where the Confederates were, 15,000 of them. You know how much ground it takes to hold 15,000 men in an attack? The Confederate lines were a mile long and a half a mile deep. Yeah, 15,000 men. We throw numbers around all the time. That's how many men. Uh, it was a mass. It was a wall of human flesh moving across that field. This is about a mile. I've walked it many times. So this is, and that is the stone wall that the Union troops were behind. This is Cemetery Ridge. And so Lee's plan is that he was going to line, and get this down, he lined 160 cannons up there along Seminary Ridge, 160 cannons. He's going to mass his artillery. <clears throat> By the way, that's his artillery chief. 26, he's not much older than you, 26 years old, Porter Alexander. Porter Alexander. It was with Lee throughout the war. He wrote a book. You ought to read that book, Porter Alexander, 26. Don't tell me young people can't handle responsibility. Wars are fought by young people. But anyway, he lined 160 cannons up. And the plan was, was to literally blow a hole through the Union lines. There would be nothing left. There wouldn't be a grasshopper alive over there. Because look, you know, you still see, we know the outcome of the battle, but you still stand there, or I do anyway, is, and I've been going up there to Gettysburg since the 70s, uh, you still stand there at that Lee statue and you look across that long field and you say, you know, I'll do deference to General Lee, but who would send 15,000 men across this open field against entrenched troops? That just doesn't make sense. And by the way, Longstreet said that to Lee when Lee announced that plan. Lee said, we can do it. And Longstreet said this, this is a paraphrase, but it's pretty close. He said, General, there were never 15,000 men in the history of the world that can do what you're asking those men to do. And Lee said, and, and of course, you know, people say he must have been, no, Lee says, we're going to blast, we're going to blast that, there won't be anything left. There's just going to be a gigantic hole where the Union Army was, and we're going to march through, link up with Stuart, and head south, and the war is over. And if things had worked out like Lee ordered them, thought they would, believe they would, you know, I guess we would be, uh, you know, uh, praising him today as some great military genius right along with Alexander the Great and Hannibal. But like General Eisenhower said, he said the, the, the best battle plan <clears throat> lasts until the battle starts, okay? And I guess this is a perfect, perfect example of that. Uh, well, the same night that Lee, second night, the same night that Lee uh, you know, meets with his officers to tell them the plans for the next day. Meade, just not very far, just in five minutes, you can walk from that wall. There's a little farmhouse down there. And it's a, just, a, it's a, you could put it in this room, a half this room. And that was Meade's headquarters during the war. You can't, I don't think you can go in anymore. You just look, I've actually been in it. The old days you can walk in, but millions of people visit Gettysburg, you know, you can tramp the place to pieces. So you can look through the windows. So I'll let you do that. But he was meeting with his officers and he just polled them. He said, you know, what do you think we ought to do? He said, the first two days, you know, we've done pretty well. You know, he said, should we hold what we have? Should we retreat or should we attack? And um, 
They said, let's hold one more day. They decided, let's stay where we are. And if Lee doesn't attack tomorrow, then on Monday, we will attack Lee. If Lee doesn't attack on Sunday, we will go after him on Monday. And with that, the, the conference broke up. But Winfield Scott Hancock, the guy who had ordered the day before, the guy who had ordered the, the Minnesotans to attack, yeah, he was one of the last officers to leave. And as he started to leave that little farmhouse door, uh, and if you're a history fanatic like me, you just stand when you go. You stand and just stare at that farmhouse door. I do that. Uh, but uh, it's right back here. As they're breaking up, it's just right back. As they're breaking up uh, from the meeting, Hancock's leaving, and, and me grabbed him, uh, touched his arm and said, if Lee attacked, and, and Hancock, by the way, is the commander of these troops now in the center of the line. He said, if Lee attacks tomorrow, it will be on your front. If there's an attack tomorrow, it's going to come to you. you know, I don't know what sort of intuition he had, but it turns out, it turns out that he's absolutely, he's absolutely right. Well, so came July the 3rd, write this down. So came July the 3rd, and, it started, and, and from the very beginning, you know, Eisenhower, the best battle plan lasts until the battle starts, Early, about 10 o'clock that morning. And this attack isn't going to go on until 3 o'clock. And about two o'clock, 10 o'clock that morning, excuse me, uh, things started to go wrong for the Confederates. First thing is, is that Stuart, with 10,000 men, started moving down to get in position. 10,000, I'm trying to imagine 10,000 horses. You ever been to a rodeo? Maybe there's a hundred horses there. I try and imagine, and there seem like there are horses everywhere. Imagine ten thousand, and and Stewart is marching down with his ten thousand men. When out of nowhere comes a young twenty-three year old uh, one-star general had just grad. He's the youngest general in the Union Army. He had just graduated from the West Point. If I may use you for an example, he had long blonde hair, just like yours. You can look at pictures of him, long blonde hair flowing. And uh, he just comes, and he's from Michigan, and his uh, he, he commands the 5th Michigan Cavalry, only about 1,200 of them. Uh, they're called the, maybe a few more, but not many. And they're called the Wolverines, the Michigan Wolverines. Who am I talking about? Huh? Who? George Custer, excellent. Yeah, George Custer comes out of nowhere and he hit the uh, Stewart's column. And you know, it's just like, it was just like a train. You know, you got a train going full steam ahead. They've got to make an emergency stop. The cars will just pile up on each other. And here come these ten thousand Confederates riding along, and he just hit the head of the column, and they just piled up on each other. And they had a huge cavalry fight there, uh, maybe fifteen thousand men involved in that cavalry fight. But at the end, this young Union general with not very much experience drove Stuart off the field. So before the Confederates even began to line up here for this attack, part A of their plan is, is done, is done. Well, uh, so meanwhile, uh, in front of Cemetery Ridge, you know, it's a hot July sultry day. It's very humid. In fact, on July the 4th, when Lee starts his retreat, uh, the day after Pickett's charge, uh, it rained. Okay, you, you've ever you, you've been in one of those. We're getting in that time of the year where it's, of course, our humidity is nothing compared to back east. But you know, we're going to have some humid days. It's about to rain, but you know it's pretty sticky. Well, that's the way it was. And, uh, early in the morning, these Union troops were on <coughs> alert here because they expect the Confederate attack at any time. But seven o'clock turned to eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. And, it's a hot day, and everybody up here just sort of hunted a shade tree or an ammunition wagon to get under and lay down and take a nap. Uh, meanwhile, Lee was lining up 160 cannons. And by the way, some of those cannons are still over there. When you walk down Cemetery Ridge, they're the originals, okay? So remember that when you're there. You're not looking at some sort of replica. They may have a few replicas, but they're original cannons. And anyway, 160 cannons, and all of a sudden at about 1 o'clock, the air just exploded. Uh, and these, uh, they started bombing. And of course, these Union boys jumped up out of their skins, went and got behind that wall, and the Confederates are firing, and they are supposed to blow that wall away. You know, the longer I study history, the more amazed I am at things, little seemingly insignificant things that influence the outcome of great events. You know, those cannons were supposed to hit, say that Union wall was over there on those lockers, 
They were supposed to hit that and blow it out. There was supposed to be nothing there but a hole. The shot actually, the shots actually land down there about the concession stand. And the reason for that is, is that they had new ammunition. And the reason they had new ammunition is that about a month before Lee headed north with his army, the Tredegar Iron Works in Richmond, and that's where Lee got his ammunition, the Confederate, burned to the ground. And so they couldn't produce any more ammunition. And most of the cannonballs that Lee carried north with him came from a, uh, a, an ammunition factory or plant, we would call it today, in South Carolina. And it had a longer fuse. And so instead of exploding there, it exploded there. And those Union boys behind that wall, I'm sure that it jarred their teeth. I'm sure their hearing was never the same again after two hours of this, but it didn't touch them. That wall was untouched. And the valley is going to fill up with smoke. Neither side can see each other. Porter Alexander rides out on a horse. That young guy I just showed you rides out on a horse and stands in his stirrup and he's trying to see because he wants to see when the Union guns are out. Because when the Union guns are out, it will be safe to send those 15,000 men across. At first, the Union artillery right here answered back to the Confederates. But the more and more the Confederate artillery fire centered on the center of the line, that was a dead giveaway that an attack was about to happen. So after about a couple of hours of just exchanging shots with the Confederates, all of a sudden, the Union guns stopped firing just all at once. And what did Porter Alexander believe? He believed that they were gone. They had been taken out. And he turns his horse around and he rides, he spurs his horse, and Longstreet, who's against this attack 100%, was sitting on a split rail fence. And Porter Alexander came up to him and said, General, if you're going to send General Pickett's division forward, you better do it now before they can bring up fresh guns. And Pickett was there. And Pickett, was that I'm showing you a picture of Pickett? Yeah, he was quite the dandy. He was about to get married. Uh, he had long curly hair and he perfumed it in the morning. Okay. He, he loved that. And uh, he's just quite the dandy dresses, dresses in a fancy uniform and pick it. There he is. He sort of saunters up to long street and he said, general, shall I lead my division forward? And long street could not long street was so opposed to this that he couldn't bring himself to give the order to attack. And instead he just downed his head. And at that picket, saluted sort of just, you know, and said, General, I'm going to lead my division forward. And then Pickett rode across this line right there. The Confederates are back in those trees. That's part of it. That's the Lee statue. That's where Lee stood and watched Pickett's charge or sat on his horse. And Pickett just takes, and Longstreet's down here, uh, and Pickett just takes off riding in front of that. And as he rides, those 15,000 men start coming out of the woods, and they're all formed up. Uh, and the smoke, a, a, a little breeze just sort of wafts it, and the smoke is cleared, and the Union troops up there behind that wall, they start to raise up because the artillery fire stopped, and they said, many of them, when they were old, when they were old men, they never forgot that. They said, when that smoke cleared away, he said, it was just, before the bombardment, there was nobody over there, and then when that smoke cleared, there were 15,000 Confederates. They said it was like the curtain in the theater raising for the final dramatic act. And uh, Pickett rode along in front of those men and they step out and form up. And just before they stepped off in what has been called the death march of the Confederacy, Pickett, I think, gave the most magnificent order of the Civil War. He said to those Virginians and Carolinians, and he said, up, up, men, and to your post. And remember this day, you are from old Virginia. And with that, the drums began to roll, and they started across the field. Uh, we'll finish Pickett's Charge after your test. We'll take a test. Though. Where's this test going to begin? Have we said? Well, where'd your last test go down to? Antietam. Huh? Antietam. Antietam. Yeah, well... Yeah, go back, go back, look at everything from Bull Run on, but I'll write down Antietam.